Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Friday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Khan, and Dennis Dick with you. We got a jam-packed show in terms of both market and gas. A lot going on today. So in terms of the market, you know the drill. Uh, you saw what happened after the close yesterday. So what's hot is not hot this morning. The reversal of the, uh, the COVID trade from the past couple days or weeks. We'll talk about uh, Gilead. We'll talk about... Uh, uh, what else is weak here this morning? Zoom is weak. Uh, Slack is weak. We'll talk about just the entire reversal from the past couple of days. Uh, we'll also talk about Boeing or restarting their production. Uh, we have earnings from PG. I don't want to forget about that. And a lot to get to as far as guests. Uh, our first guest will be, well, it'll actually be a tandem at 835 when we joined by Jason Rasnick, who's our uh, founder and CEO. And he, we're going to be joined by Ross Gerber, who's the president and CEO of Gerber Kowalski, noted Tesla or Gerber Kawasaki, excuse me, uh, noted uh, Tesla bull. And uh, we'll talk overall market and get uh, Ross's thoughts on Tesla here, why they're better positioned, uh, why actually the pandemic may have helped Tesla going forward. And then at nine, uh, we're going to stay late and I'm going to be joined by Yad Azbahi. He is the founder of uh, Precinct Point Capital and he's going to talk about a short and a long he's got. Uh, in this market. He's got one uh, one very highly convicted short and one highly convicted long. So a lot to get to on this show today. I'll throw it to Joel now. Uh, Joel, tell us about this overnight session. Oh, major green on the screen. It started uh, in the after hour, after the market was closed. You got the Gilead news. You got the Boeing news. S&P's opened up at 28.63. Uh, your pre-market low, 28.50. I was kind of hoping for it to get to the pair of highs in 28.46 from Tuesday, uh, but no can do. I don't know if we'll see that today. Your pre-market high is 28.85. That kind of puts us in no man's land here. Uh, we did have a high on uh, March 10th at 28.73.50, but another juicy target on the upside could be our March Eighth high at 2904.75. Holy smokes. Talking about the 2900 handle. You have crude. Crude was up, gave it back. Now basically flat on the session, up nine cents at 25.62. Who needs gold when you can own stocks? Gold down $24.80 at 1706.30. Silver in the red by 2.13% at 1529.5. That's uh, 32.7 cents. Bitcoin having less than a $200 range this morning, down $30 at $7,075. Uh, Triple D called me last night. And uh, how many positions did you end up with last night? I think over 80. I had over 80 overnight positions. So put on last night. So, and what it was, was the dash for trash. If you looked at my overnight portfolio, it'd be like, holy cow, because I was buying the trash and selling the stocks that aren't the trash, um, the selling the COVID plays. Uh, that was the trade last night. It continues this morning. So the stocks that have been hated by the markets are the ones getting bought. Those stocks that have been loved by the markets are the ones getting sold. Big reversal trade here this morning. So incredible trading action. Um, that was relentless buying in so many different of the beat up names. And they turned around, they started slamming stocks like Amazon. Amazon right now is down 20 points. So you can say, oh, well, it was up 50 or up 100. But I mean, the market's trading up. It's funny how these things have moved into a counter market trade. The Amazon, the Netflix is down this morning. The ATVI, I still own that one in the long term portfolio. Um, you know, so the gaming stocks, Peloton trading down. Uh, work, uh, which is Slack Technologies, trading down significantly in the pre-market, despite the market being a lot higher. So big reversal. You got to understand these relationships if you are a day trader. They're very important to understand because there's money to be made. Another you trade do that? I made. I, you mentioned a lot of stocks there, and yeah. I, 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 maybe we have some new listeners. Could you just just give another 30-second explanation on that? I do. Uh, I do the index ARP. 
So I'm just doing like ETF arbitrage for the most part, but also with a spin, like I know the relationships. So last night, for instance, I, this took some guts, but I took Procter Gamble. Procter Gamble was trading up three bucks last night. They were hitting all the defensive stocks. I took it short through the report. So I said that to you last night. I was yeah. like, I'm, I'm going to hold this short through the report because I think even if they beat, I think Procter & Gamble goes down just because it's defensive and they're selling those stocks today. And what do you know? Procter & Gamble comes out with a slight beat, not, not great, but a slight beat, and they slam the stock down. I've already covered it, so I can freely talk about it. It actually went down to 118 and change. I got covered in the 120s right around here. So I took uh, three and a half or four points out of it. That's probably three points. Probably three points. So a little more than three points, maybe, because I was covering the 120s. But um, it was just, you know, just understanding the relationship right now. Um, the earnings, if they would have really blew it away, maybe it could go higher. But we also saw in the case of, you know, Abbott Labs and Abbott Labs come back. But we saw that one, you know, have an earnings report, rally significantly on the good numbers, but then give it back because it was just happening to be the day that they were selling those kind of stocks. So you've got to understand those relationships if you're a trader. If you're a long-term investor, it doesn't matter as much because relationships change. But I make money because I understand the short-term relationships. Okay. Do we want to do the PG report or is it? You no, know, I, I want to talk about why this reversal happened here. Uh, and yep. it, was, it was really like a, it was a combo uh, of, of a few different headlines. We, of course, had the press conference yesterday uh, from the White House. They outlined their uh, Open America Up Again uh, plan. Uh, which which entirely hinges on having testing available, but it was at least uh, a plan in place. There was no timetable, no dates, other than the fact that each uh, phase of the plan lasts two weeks long, and then you advance to the next phase if you if you have widespread testing and if you have a a, pl a, a plateau of new cases and plateau of deaths and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there was there was that plan being outlined. Trump said, what did he say? 29 states could open relatively soon. So mm -hmm. who knows about that? But we, we got that. We got the scoop from our old buddy Adam Feuerstein at Stat News that this uh, trial with Gilead's drug Remdesivir uh, is is uh, supposedly uh, reportedly uh, really helping, and that a majority of the patients have gotten discharged from the hospital. So this drug appears to be working. And then there was also the Boeing news that Boeing is going to restart production uh, at at their uh, Washington uh, facilities. So it was like a three headed monster that uh, we we got good drug news. We got Boeing restarting production, and we have. Uh, some, some sort of plan in place for the overall economy to, to come back to life here. The big news was Gilead. Um, and unbelievably, you know how I've talked about owning this stock for a while. I bought it once down at 68 and then I got spooked out and sold it at 69. That was back, you know, before we had the big crash down on the March. Actually, it was that day, I believe I bought it. And I got spooked out of it. Um, I've wanted to get the stock back and I looked at this trend and this trend, I looked at this trend two days ago and I was like, man, this is going back um, to, I'm losing track of days, Wednesday's action. <laughs> and it was trading down a buck. And I'm like, I love the trend that it's forming. And I'm like, it's, it's got some, it's got value. I mean, Gilead is my classic value type stock, but I'm like, it's got the wild card because this, this drug is in the trials. So I took a flyer and I threw a big chunk of my portfolio. I took actually more than a full size position because I was really liking that that had the potential to come. So I actually bought the stock at 74, I believe it paid 74.80 two days ago in my long-term portfolio. I uh, wish I would have had a chance to talk about it yesterday. We just never got around to it. Um, and obviously, um, you know, I'm benefiting from it this morning. So just good luck on the timing. I mean, I, it was still a good investment because... I knew they had these trials, obviously, you know, two days later, they come out with, you know, good news. Um, I got lucky that I got in there. Um, I, I read the, the report from Adam Feuerstein. It sounds pretty good. So I actually did sell. So I've got half. So I sold half the Gilead here in the pre-market because I feel like that's a big overnight move. Kept half. St trials are still going on here, obviously. And um, I read the Gilead. I read the, the Adam Feuerstein stuff. And it sounds like a lot of people who are taking that drug are, are getting better in a hurry. So that's the good news. And that's really what propelled us, I believe, over. They want, you know, some type of therapy that appears to be working. That's what the market has. Oh, whether this rally can, when the curve was flattening, this is a rally based on health. That's what the market wanted. So I would think that this could potentially hold 
better than if it was. Uh, full disclosure, uh, this is a Lisa pick. Ox uh, and possible. Dr- All right, let's uh, move on to the Boeing news. Yeah, well, the Boeing news is they're reopening, produ- restarting production, which is which is huge. They're restarting production uh, at their Puget Sound uh, facility here. Let me read the actual headline here. Uh, production of the 747, 767, 77, 7, and 787, and they're going to resume working towards restarting the 737 program. So, good news for Boeing. I traded this last night. I actually bought it on the headline around 138. And, oh, th- and yeah, and, and you know what? I'm trading so many stocks and I was reading it. And I was like, I don't know what that means. I literally didn't have time to even like look into the details of it. So I turned around and sold it. I think I, I made, I made a little bit of money on it, but um, obviously I should have just, you know, closed my eyes and just held on to it. So that was a bad one um, because I was in well, and then I talked myself out of it. You, you know why sometimes I get out of these crazy ones because after hours, I'm trading so much. I'm doing the ETF hour, but I'm doing so many other things. If I'm in something that requires a lot of attention, I can't give it to it. So if a stock's moving too actively, I can't actually trade it because um, I, I can't trade it well because you've got to devote too much attention to it. I mean, imagine having 80 positions overnight, you know, mostly from different arbitrage type strategies, and then you got to work a Boeing, um, so which is moving around like crazy. It makes it difficult. So that's why a lot of times, like I call it babysitting. I have to babysit that position because it's a really active mover at the time. So sometimes it's like, I don't have time for this. I just turn around and sell it. And I think that was my train of thought. And obviously I should have just, you know, held on to it and not looked at it again. And I would have been, pretty, been made out like a bandit, but it's up another 10 bucks from where I had it last night. Uh, yeah, you had to keep an eye on that. Michael stores and Kohl's. I had I had Michaels. I bought Michaels last night. I still own Coles in the overnight portfolio here. I will be selling this here this morning. Um, I have bought a lot of retail stocks last night. Uh, On those headlines, you could see the dash for trash. And I was like, what kind of trash can I buy? And you know, we're not saying the companies are trash. We're saying the stocks have been underperforming. And you know, we call it the dash for trash. But I was able to buy Coles, I believe it's 1762 or something, like up a penny. You know, when the, when the market started ripping and I was all off the of Gilead when Gilead did that, I was like, I'm buying stocks. And I, you know, obviously I already own Gilead, but I was turning around just buying other stocks and I did really well. Um, I, I'm still in some of the positions, so I shouldn't say I did really well because I don't know what the outcome is on some of them. But so far, so good. I, I had one of my best nights of the year last night. If, if it continues this morning, like I've still got some of these positions on, which I've got to work out at the open, but it was a pretty good night. Uh, Spinner, I, you're seeing 75,000 at the, uh, 145 calls, um, that expired today. I see an open interest of 10,726. So I'm not sure where that 75,000, uh, I mean, obviously this is just, uh, I don't know. I I'm seeing 10,700. So anyways, if you were so inclined to pay a buck, for something that was 13 points out of the money, you're being rewarded right now because it is worth. You're not uh, being rewarded much. No. You I bought mean, the 145 tr- calls for a buck. They're only yeah. worth four. And you got the direction, right? And you got a ridiculous move in your direction. I don't think you did that great on that. You'd been better buy the stock. Yeah. I, I guess people I don't. The problem is with the options, you know, as a prop trader, I have a lot of capital. You know, I have a, access to a lot of capital. You know, in a retail account, people like to buy options because they don't have access to that kind of capital. So it gives them cheap exposure to stocks, you know, to, it gives them cheap, you know, a, a lot more exposure for a, a lot less money. So that's the difference when you're a prop trader and you have access to firm capital, you, you, you don't need the options as much because you just want to get long exposure to a thousand Boeing and buy a thousand Boeing. So, but, you know, you think about that's 149 grand. So, you know, it's excellent it's, point. It, it, it's, you know, that's why a lot of, you know, traders with smaller accounts pick on the options because that's how they get the exposure. So I can't argue with you if you're doing it for that reason. Okay. Uh, you're pretty much, we're just busting at the highs of the session here. Uh, continuing to make new highs, 149.40. Uh, good. Yep. A good trick on here on Boeing would be see what your high is at 929 and 59 seconds. Uh, see if it continues through that level and kind of use that as a bogey. If I'm giving you additional targets on the upside, your three-day high is 152.40. That's within uh, earshot. Uh, your four-day high, 
156. And if things get really going north, uh, your five day high is 157.98. So there's uh, some early parameters. I don't know. Not, not much of a book in this, right, Dennis? I mean, is there any chance the book holds it down and you get a chance to scoop it up? Always like- a chance. There's always a chance that the book will have something in it to hold it down. Remember, it's option expiration here today, too. Yeah. So you could see some, you know, incredible moves here at the open. I'm trying to look in the book just to see. Okay. There's uh oh wow the book's pretty empty Joel I don't really see much of yeah that. I mean, yeah they're not showing their hand uh seven hundred fifty one thousand everything's just been cleaned of, out yeah and uh, what we mean by that is obviously with the stock trading at the one thirty four uh, closing at one thirty four twenty four there's orders on the book GTC orders going up you know all the way uh that need you know that people are like hey I'm gonna leave my one forty sale in. I'll get the print on the open and I'll be pretty darn happy with it. Um, so there's just going to be orders going up for the next, uh, you know, 15 handles uh, to where we're at. 149.40 is the current high. So that's a quick look at uh, at Boeing. Jump over. Uh, just so many stocks to talk about. But again, let's talk the rotation here because this sure. is a serious issue for a lot of people who are hiding out right now. Amazon has been running for days the COVID play, like look at this Amazon run. It's been absolutely incredible. Four days ago, the stock was 2000, just over 2000 bucks, 2038. Got up to 2460 yesterday. Holy mackerel. Now you're pulling back here this morning because this has been a hiding ground. So what you're seeing is this massive rotation out of food, out of the COVID stocks that we've been talking about and into Obviously, all the trash stocks that we've been talking about as well. Brick and mortar is hot here this morning. Whether that continues or not, I don't know. Um, but you know, if you know, if you think you're getting out of the woods, and you know, the market is thinking that, oh, hey, we're closer to you know a, a therapy that works than we were yesterday. That's kind of makes sense. So you're seeing Zoom get hit here. Zoom's down six bucks in the pre-market. Teladoc is down eight bucks in the pre-market. Peloton, which has been running and running as COVID play down to, is down $2 in the pre-market. So is this time to sell those stocks or is this time to buy on the pullback because maybe we're not out of the woods? What What's your thoughts, you know, on all these COVID plays because they've all been running, Joel? I wouldn't <laughs> touch them. I wouldn't. Go ahead, Spence. This has got to be a gift, right? I mean, this is a, this is a, we, this is a Friday morning gift. Why? You think Amazon... That just ran 300 or 400 points in four trading sessions. A 30-point sell-off is a gift. It might be. No, 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 oh, no. I, I, I should be more clear. I think the the stocks that are up today, that's a gift. There you go. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, I just look here, and um, obviously, you know, overnight portfolio is one thing. And people was asking me, "You're not owning Kohl's in your long-term portfolio?" No, Kohl's is not in my long-term portfolio. It's in my overnight portfolio because it's hot. I trade what's hot. I buy what's hot, I sell what's cold in the overnight portfolio. It's all rotation. I'm trading rotation constantly. It works. Um, I'm very torn on a few of these stocks. I think like if you were to get, and here's a stock that I would like to get is Kroger back at 30. It's 3180. It's down 15 cents. It hasn't had the run, so it's not selling off significantly. But, you know, Walmart's down. Cost goes down. There's a lot of stocks trading the red, not massively in the red, but they're in the red because they've been so hot as the COVID plays. So it's not surprising. But I think if you get a pullback in some of those stocks, that's more significant than a dime or, you know, $30 in the case of Amazon. Maybe you do look in that area. I mean, the Amazon move has just been so incredible. I almost would want a 50% retracement of the recent move if I was to get in it. Yeah, I, I, I would I would be careful. I mean, it could it's so very, sky high. Huh? Yeah, I mean, it very well could turn around and end up green on the session. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's an interesting. Spencer, show this uh, this 15 minute chart here because someone is kind of making a stand here. For and, Amazon? Yeah, at Amazon. I mean, it's so hard because it's such a high price stock. But like 20, I mean, we're at the lows of the pre-market session, 23.72, and we're two bucks off it, but we're not whooshing down. Like no one, no one's panicking on this and saying, you know, get me out. And I don't think you could do that in a stock like this because, you know, if you want to sell, you know, 50,000 shares, you're not going to show a 50,000 share offer and let the, you know, and let the bots uh, get ahead of you. So I think you just got someone uh, selling in smaller size. 
Let's look at the bottom of yesterday's range, which we were already uh, 2374. You're not even at yesterday's low yet. Yesterday's low was 2335. And then I think you get the rug pull under that. Your two day low is 2245. Your three day low, 2186. Your four day low, you got a pair of lows uh, at let's call it 2030. So, I mean, if you're buying this thing, you know, on a scalp, or if you took it short home or night, that's one thing. But someone comes in to sell a big piece on this. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you get a downgrade too on evaluation. There's not a downgrade, but I'm just saying, you know, the possibility of that. Just so. think about the market cap, like of Amazon, for that to move. And it did. You know, you talk about the 400 point move that it just had on two thousand. It moved 20% in four days. This is Amazon. Like, I mean, this is a trillion dollar company. How, that, that's an incredible amount of market cap just created because, oh, yeah, we're going to be stuck in our homes forever just ordering off of Amazon. Is that really, you know, what's going to be happening? We're not going to be stuck in our homes forever. You know, they're already talking about opening up the economy. So this rally in Amazon of that much is unsustainable, in my opinion. Um, can it continue? The trend is your friend. I'm not shorting it because I don't short rocket ships. But what Nick Shaheen, Nick, if you're listening, we love, we love you. Uh, what he always says is it's too high to chase, but too hot to short when they see stuff like this. And I think he might say the same thing, if Nick, if you're around. But that's what I'm saying. I'm using the Nick Shaheen saying too high to, for me to chase this up here now. But it's way too hot for me to short it here too. So, you know, maybe as a as a trade last night when it was trading up, and you know, you could see the reversal happening. But now that it's down thirty bucks on the highs, you know, shorting it now, who the hell knows? I mean, you're you're seventy points off of yesterday's high. So wild trading is the bottom line here. A lot of these stocks are really trading wild right now, it's, especially with this much market, you know, with with this much action going on where they're buying this and selling this. Uh, but it's definitely not a buy everything rally. Gold is down, Walmart's down, the food stocks are down, Clorox is down. I mean, there are stocks that are, are, are trading down here this morning, the COVID plays. Then the beat up ones are all trading higher. I mean, you got stocks like, you know, Marriott that are trading. Full disclosure, I do have a position on Marriott uh, up, you know, 78%. Some of the hotel stocks are trading significantly higher. Pretty incredible moves. Uh Exactly. SPs are leaking here a little bit. I mean, considering the after hours move, considering the overnight move, yeah. uh, some people are rigging the register here a little bit. I'm kind of thinking we've seen the high for the day here. Uh, 2885. That's your pre market high. I think. I think we're good there. I think to tack on another 20 handles, I'd use it as a, uh, a resistance point. I think I would be a little bit hesitant on a range extension trade, you know, getting long if we take that out. Um, on the downside, 28.50, uh, that's your pre-market low. Uh, you just have the double top from Tuesday and Wednesday there as potential support. So some, uh, some wide levels here, but this is a, a wide market. Should we look at any of these other... COVID plays for some well, potential can, can, setup. Can we look, can we look at Apple here? Uh, Apple yeah. is catching Apple's catching a downgrade this morning uh, from Goldman Sachs uh, from <laughs> to to sell from neutral, lowering its price target again. Uh, it is now down to uh, two thirty three. It was at two fifty before, and it was at uh, where was it? He lowered it. This is like the third time he's lowered it uh, this year. So price target 233 sell Apple says Goldman Sachs this morning on just modeling for more uh, a weaker uh, uh, stronger reduction in, in iPhone demand. It's been an incredible run here for Apple as well since the lows that we hit back at 228. I own this stock or 212. I own this stock in my investment portfolio. It actually crossed my mind to sell it. So I don't mind this call from Goldman. They're just looking two thirds of the losses back. Um, you look and you think they're going to get hit. I mean, you know, it's not like iPhone is just impervious to sellers. I mean, um, you know, if we do go into a recession or, you know, I don't, and I didn't read the, the Goldman note, but if we do go, you know, into a full recession here, yeah, maybe people are holding on to their iPhones a little bit longer than normal. Um, so, you know, that thought process, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, like I said, what the Goldman thought process is, but it's had a hell of a run. It's not cheap. Stock is not trading cheap here. Um, I've been in it for so long. I have trouble, you know, to sell this and lock, and lock in a huge capital gain. I'm probably going to hold on to it, but it crossed my mind too. So I don't mind this call. Complete talking against my buck, 
But I feel like the Apple, you know, the, the, the easy money has been made on the long side here in the last couple of weeks. Okay. And, and some people hold on to their old iPhone forever. Look at mine. I think this is a 5S or something. Oh, I'm on that too. I, I'm yeah. on the same thing. I, I, I just don't, I don't need a tablet in my pocket when I'm walking around. And that's what those new phones are. They're doing so, too big for you. Yeah. And so I think I will, aren't they coming out with a smaller one or has that been delayed or I thought they were coming out with the new smaller one. I'm going to hold out for that. Uh, phew. Well, the market is ignoring this call. It's up $3 and 66 cents, uh, just under the percentage of the market is. So uh, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know. It, they're not ignoring it at all. Because it's down, it's 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 up only point. Oh, eighty one cents. I was looking at Mr. Softy. I'm sorry. Yeah. So looking... Apple is trading down. You know, you can say okay, roughly the Qs yeah. are up one point seven, but that would have some Fresh weight start. on the Qs as well. So say two percent. Nasdaq overall is up about two percent. Apple's basically flat. So they're knocking a couple percent off of Apple relative to where the Qs are trading. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised the stock goes red. I mean, it's come this far. It's Goldman. It's they're significant. I mean, out of all the analysts, they probably have. You know, they carry if not the most weight right near the top. So I would not be surprised to see Apple go red today. All right. Red. Yeah. Uh, 85 69 was the close. Uh, but what about, I mean, you're nowhere near yesterday's low at eight at 82 35. So five bucks. I mean, they haven't even taken it to yesterday's low. And I know it, you know, the indexers are having to pick it up off the mat to keep up with it. Uh, but potent, I don't know if it's even going to see red going red. That's easy because it's uh, it's up 72 cents. But will it even take out yesterday's low? I don't know. In fact, you're you know, you're still close to yesterday's high. Ooh, I got a juicy spot for you. Is this correct? Is there a triple top here? There is a triple top. Someone wants out at two eight. Oh, uh, no, two tops, 88, 20 and 88 and a quarter. Not that far away from there. So if you get up there, which you, you easily could, so buying off the open, there's a nice potential target. They could have got out of 295 last night. Yeah. Apple was trading up significantly, obviously, before the downgrade happened. But big moves here in a lot of stocks. I mean, these are the times, like, you know, when you're having these ridiculous moves, even as a long-term investor, I mean, when you get moves, even like in the Gilead case where I'm getting 11% overnight, I mean, let's be honest, how much earnings power, you know, is this drug that already is in existence? You know, if it gets approved, it's going to, they're going to make more money, but they're going to make 11% more money. This isn't like a small stock. Gilead is a huge market cap. What's the market cap on Gilead? And again, I'm talking against my book because I actually, I've sold half of it, but I still have half because I think there's more maybe good news to come here. So I might hold on to half. Um, but, you know, you look at this and you're like, wow, that's a big move. So, you know, I'm lightening up in that big move. $96 billion company. All of a sudden, you know, tacking on another uh, $12, $12 billion. A big move. Is this drug worth $12 billion more? Mm, I don't, I don't know. know. You know what? Uh, I'll tell you right now, this market is not helping the, the crude bulls at all. We were we're uh, we got almost a two buck range here. We hit a high twenty six seventy eight, and now we're knocking on the door. We 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 just matched Thursday's low here at twenty four ninety three. Uh don't even have a level for you under You're that. Talking crude now. Yeah, I didn't think crude would. Uh, you know, I just kind of thought it would be like that buy everything mentality. And today. you're looking at the forward contract. The current contract's at eighteen bucks. Wow, Dennis, did that was a heck of a spread to trade. I don't know. I, I mean, this could... isn't wicked contango right now. Yeah. Wicked. So like if we go look, I'm just trying to bring up the current because I know we're looking at the, so the current, um, I'm just bringing, because we always look at the futures, but if we look at the, the current contract, which is the May, um, I can't it's get at the $17.81 right now. Oh. $17.80. Well, what's the, what's the forward contract? 25 bucks. What is that? The June? Yeah. Is that for real? Are we looking at? Are we looking WTI? I'm, I'm looking at the. I'm, I got the, the May WTI is 1780 right now. Yeah, in June is 25 bucks. I Holy swear. Holy macro. Yeah. Yep. That is just wicked contango. This is why the USO is such a terrible vehicle because you know how they do it. They sell the front month and buy the next month. They roll it every month, so they're always you know getting burned 
by the contango and obviously it's storage costs here too storage costs are just enormous you know relative to you know where oil is so that's you know the biggest issue here with you know why the stock or, or why you you know oil is is in such wicked contango it's the storage costs. It, this is actually a good segue so i'm going to bring on uh jason rasnick right now who is uh, the founder and ceo uh, of benzinga talking about oil uh and oil being uh down in the dumps uh, should theoretically be a oh, trying to there we go trying to uh, it, theoretically it should be a, a headwind uh, for a company like Tesla no so let's get Jason's thoughts here as I unmute him and turn on his camera uh, Jason good morning yo yo good morning guys good morning good morning excited for on? a big stock market Friday. Oh, it's a big day. If you're long, it's a big day. All right, so let, let me just go into it real freaking quick. Okay, so you guys were just talking about oil, but you're also talking about Gilead, and, you're, and you didn't talk about my favorite stock that I've been talking about, Madonera. I forgot how you pronounce it wrong. So I yeah. luckily, Madonna. you guys are going to like say, Madonna. Right, Sorry. Jason, Jason just calling the stocks that he, you know, um, that are up. If you go in the Benzinga pre, uh, Pro chat room, I've been buying that stock and Gilead, and to the negative one that I've been losing on is USO. But MDR, whatever, Monera, how you pronounce it, I bought call options on it three weeks ago at $31. It's at 48, and I bought Gilead at 67. I bought another one, um, uh, Johnson Johnson, but, uh, but uh, those are the two I bought because I watched, I read, I read the literature, I read, I read articles on Benzinga or other places and I just, I, they were, they are basically call options to me. What was the downside? What was the upside? They, you know, if their drugs didn't work out, the stocks weren't going to crash. So I look at probabilities and I look, Hey, what, you know, if this goes right, there's a chance of a 50% gain. If it goes wrong, I could lose 10% is what the way I thought of it. And so those are two trades that I'm just, you know, seeing that, that one is at 48 from 31 and Gilead skyrocketed last night. And you got to be patient sometimes because when I bought Gilead, I was down 8% on my buy. And I didn't rebuy, which I should have. So, okay, but talk to us about your exit strategy now. If you it's have good, it. it's a good spend, it's a good question, Spencer Israel. So, um, so it's the hard part, right? It's, it's the hard part. And I'm, and I'm, I'm bad at one thing with this market is call options, Spencer. So I bought call options for that Monera um, that, expir that expires today, April 17th, or that may have been yesterday. On those ones, I took a loss on. I lost 30% on those call options. Why? Because my expiration I chose was April. If you chose May, it made them another 60% more expensive. And my frugal, you know, um, I guess whatever, did that. And that was dumb because those call options in May now are up like 400%. And the reason I'm bringing that up, Spencer, because I bought the stock as well. And so since I was down on the call, I'm going to sell – 30% of that position, or I'm going to sell 25% of that position at market open in um, that stock. Um, the, um, you know, the Monero. Okay. Whatever, right? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to sell it. And then Royal Caribbean is at 37 today. It's up $3 uh, pre-market. When it hits 40, I'm loading up the trucks to short it. That's my um, next trade. Um, yeah. And then, and then Joel and Dennis, that oil stuff, I was wrong. On. I'm, I'm wrong. So I, I, I try to make trades that I think that the rest of the world will follow suit on eventually. And I thought USO was a no brainer trade because I thought Trump would call his buddies and say, Hey, we really need this. We really need to make this happen. And they, you know, with Corona and they would make it happen. So I've been wrong on, on you. I bought USO. I think it was like the Thursday or Wednesday. I wasn't on the show that week and it's down, I think like 14 or eight or 8% since I bought it. So those are a couple of stories. It's in but, such but wicked contango. Um, that Wait, Dennis, the natural you, deterioration, Dennis. even if oil goes nowhere, it's losing, you know, whatever that difference is every single month. It's so wicked like that. It's it, it, oil's got to go up so substantially to even make money because the contango so wicked right now. Dennis, That's Dennis, why USO it's is been a while. So tough to invest in. It's been a while since we explained contango. Explain that concept. So the front month, so you're, you're looking at the current month, the next month is trading at a higher price. What the USO does, they don't want to take physical delivery of oil, so they keep rolling it. So what they do is every month they sell the one that's expiring and they buy the next month. So they're always have that natural deterioration when the, when the next month's contract is trading for a significantly higher price than the current month. 
So and we just looked at that. So you're always getting that in you know, a loss. That's why USO over the long run is a losing, uh, it doesn't track oil well at all. It usually underperforms because of the contango. What is that? It's a storage cost of oil. Storage cost of oil is significant. So mm-hmm. that is what the significant cost is with oil. That's why I've always said, if you want oil, I would buy oil stocks. I hate oil. I've hated oil for years. I don't hardly own any oil stocks for that reason because I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, the movement to the green energy and cleaner energy. We've talked about this on the show for years as well, which is why I'm, I'm on, my exposure to oil is very limited just through some Canadian ETFs. But, um, you know, and obviously I've been right on that call, but I've been wrong on lots of things as well. So, uh, but I just think a better vehicle, if you want exposure to oil, would be to buy the oil stocks. Okay. Um, Dennis, so I wish I would have asked you first about that. <laughs> so, but I bought that USO and I'm it's like at five dollars now. Like, could it go to zero? Could it go to two? So again, I, I go to my probabilities and I don't know this. I'm not an expert at oil at all. As you guys can tell, you guys can walk circles around me. Um, I'm an energy guy. We'll get to Tesla in a second. So I'm I mean I'm an electric energy guy, you know, electric. So I don't yeah. know oil. So I bought USO thinking that was just the default trade. If oil goes up, buy USO. It's at five dollars. Can it go to two dollars? I guess that's my question. It can just keep going down. Like it will over time, it depends on how long you hold it, but it just continues to deteriorate. So if you take USO on any given chart and you look, okay, well, you know, there's been moments where, you know, it can go to backwardation where it's actually not hitting it, but normally it's trading in contango. So it's always just slowly erodes your capital. It's actually in the prospectus, if you read it over the long term, that, you know, erosion of capital, which is, it just makes sense. It's a storage cost that costs money to store oil. That's why, you know, it, so this is kind of built into, that's what you're seeing why it's in such wicked contango because, you know, when oil is trading at $100 a barrel, while well, the relative cost of storing it is small compared to the current price. But when oil is trading at 17, 18 bucks, well, yeah, that what, storage cost is right, enormous. I, 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 let, let me hop in here just real quick. What they're going to do is oil heads towards, you know, 10 and 15 is they'll do a reverse split in the USL. And now, in yeah, so they, they do yeah. that, they, right. and then they bring okay. the price back. I, 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 I want to pivot. I, I, I want to pivot. Spencer, I, I got to jump in. I got. We, yeah, I gotta, but can I, gotta, but can, can, can I bring? Can I bring? No, can I bring no, our guest no. on? No, no, no. You want to bring a guest on? Okay, bring the guest on. <laughs> Spencer, let's follow protocol, man. Let's come on. It's the script. Uh, <laughs> All right. Spencer tries to break break stuff up, and I'm uh, trying to get get it back in. Uh, I, I've already te- I've already teased our so Spencer, one second. Um. Two quick things, guys. I've seen the chat room go crazy about my task call at $1.40 and then $1.60. That's symbol T-A-S-T, nice Carol's Group. And I went, I we loaded up the truck at T-A-S-T at one at one forty four and then one fifty nine. I see five of you guys randomly mention it as I joined the chat room and you guys are saying thank you. So I appreciate that because most people usually just, you know, call you out for your mistakes, not your ones that you got right. Well, I gave you guys at about 140 to 160. It's at 290 today. What am I doing? That's the question you're asking. I sold 30% of the position yesterday. I'm not telling you to go sell it. My sources, my whatever, say the stock has a lot more room to run, but you could wake up on a Monday or Tuesday and the stock could fall 50%. This is a stock, like I said before, I played probabilities. It's going to either go to eight to $12 over the next year, or it's going to be at a dollar, a dollar fifty. So I like the risk versus reward. So that's okay. why I went so high with that. Again, they own Burger Kings. That's TAST, T-A-S-T. I hope I addressed the chat room. Now we're running late and I'm really excited and Spencer wanted to do it, but I'm just going to steal his thunder right now. I'm really excited to bring on a friend, um, a big Tesla bull who's been calling the story since the beginning. Um, his name is Ross Gerber. If you want to add any more comments, Spencer, before you bring him on, feel free. But this is one of my friends and I'm going to be on on Fridays. Every other Friday, I'm going to bring a special guest. And today, my special guest is Ross Gerber. And Ross, Hello. welcome. Thanks. Welcome to the show, Ross. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Ross, you're out. You're. I know Spencer's excited to ask you some macro questions. I just want to, you and I have been talking Tesla for a long time. How long ago did you get out there and become so outspoken on Tesla? Because I know anytime you tweet something, you have your haters, you have your people that love you. <laughs> just give, How long ago did this start and like, so, you're, so you were so outspoken? Well, I mean, I've always been outspoken, uh, you know, whether it's attacking the horrible presidency of the Trump administration or, or, um, you know, back in the companies I like and going after the companies I don't like. Um, You know, I've, I'm an activist investor. So, 
if I own a company and I don't like the direction it's going to, you know, we push for change and, and I do that through the media. And um, if it's a company that is doing all the right things, obviously I'm trying to help that company grow and, and give it strategic ideas and just had a great call with some of the people at Zoom, actually of all people, um, about some ideas that they can implement for this amazing business that they're building. Um, it's growing like crazy. Um, so, you know, I bought Tesla seven years ago and I never thought it would become, you know, such a polarizing topic, but you guys began the conversation talking about trading oil before I came on. And one of the things I, I think is that oil is worthless. So if you're long oil, you know, boy, you got to watch out for Tesla. And that's why there were so much attacks on Tesla for so long, whether it was the car industry or the oil industry um, or investors who are heavily invested in those industries have so much to lose by Tesla's success. And now we're seeing it. Now we're seeing everything. The reason I get attacked so heavily is that everything those people were fighting for, it, it's now happening to them, what they didn't want Tesla to do, which was to make oil basically obsolete. Not obsolete, like we'll still use it, but that it will never grow its, its uh, demand ever again. So if you have a supply that's unlimited and a demand that's limited, um, boy, you know, you got a problem. And that's why oil is where it is today and, and probably going lower, um, you know. So Tesla is, is, is just an incredible opportunity. Um, they are completely changing the way things have done, been done in cars, uh, in storage, um, and in solar. And so um, to be in those three industries in one company is, is ridiculous. It's, Ross, it's, Dennis Dick, I've been following you for a long time on Twitter and you've been all over the Tesla call. So congratulations on that. I'm one of your fans. I know how there's you. lots of haters on Twitter. I've got some myself, but you know, I am definitely a Ross Gerber fan. You've been all you over know, I, have, I mean, I have almost 69,000 fans. So like if four people don't like, there you, know, you Twitter, go. Twitter, Twitter isn't really a real place. Like so when 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 Trump got arrest uh, when Trump got arrested when Trump got elected, um, I I was pretty pissed off and and I tweeted something that was really stupid, and um, the white supremacist slash Russian slash tweet attack machine that he has just attacked the hell out of me when my tweet hit about seventy thousand views you know and it murdered me I mean they. They made up stories that I was a, a threatening the president's life and this and that. The Secret Service came to my office. Wow. I mean, it was insane. And my, I was scared for my life. I literally was getting threats, death threats. They posted my address, pictures of my family. Um, and it was one of the worst experiences of my life. And um, it went on for two days. And after two days, they shut the computers off. And it just stopped. It just stopped. Everything stopped. And I realized that probably half of Twitter isn't real. It's like not one friend of mine, not one client, not, you know, my friends love making fun of me. And, and like the pictures that were posted about me, like my friends would have had a field day if they found this stuff. But nobody uses Twitter, really. The only people who use Twitter really is a small slice of people who are very engaged with news, um, the media. And all the people trying to manipulate the media. And so it's like, in real life, I could tweet like, I'm a huge fan of Stalin. And, and you know, my friends, my family, nobody would know, you know, they don't follow any of it. But everybody on Twitter would be like, oh, Ross likes Stalin. He's a, you know, he's a murderer. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a unique place where people like to come around and scream about everything they're unhappy about or try to make a difference or try to get stuff out or try to, you know, work with the media. So there's a lot of good with Twitter. And I think it's one of the best sources of information for investors. In fact, if you're an investor and you're not on Twitter, you're at a serious disadvantage. I mean, serious disadvantage in the marketplace. Um, and on the other side of the coin, you have to know what you're reading. You have to you really understand what you're reading because you will get everything out there. You know. Yeah. Uh, Ross, I just want to ask you about Tesla real quick. Is there a chance that this pandemic, uh, that it actually benefits Tesla in the long oh, run? Oh, totally. That's why it's going up again. I mean, like, so Elon, 
you know, I've spent a little time with Elon and I've spent a lot of time following him. And Elon is my age and we went to school together. We lived two blocks away from each other and we had this sort of, sort of weird thing. And then it like, he went to Silicon Valley and I went into finance and he became this like monster <laughs> businessman, you know? And um, whenever I talk to him, I, I, he is so smart and, you know, I'm not an engineer and, and he understands what he's doing better than anybody else who's doing it. And so he's innovated things that other companies in the best days, in their best, most, like most money they could spend, best people they could hire would struggle to compete with Tesla, but that's not what's actually happening. And now with the pandemic, First of all, you have electric competitors like Rivian who are now like slow down. So Rivian was a real competitor to Tesla longer term because they were making a high end SUV like a Land Rover. So Rivian is kind of like a Land Rover to me of, of EVs. And so I thought they'd be successful because Amazon's backing them and everybody needs EV trucks. Um, but, but the truth is now Rivian's stuck because everybody's stuck on financing and who wants to throw hundreds of millions into a speculative adventure now and the factory shut down and they were barely getting going. GM and Ford are like fighting for solvency in my mind. You know, if you go into the bond market today, boy, a lot of bonds for Ford and GM you could buy. A lot of people don't want them. Um, how do these companies compete with such an innovative company when the culture is so broken at these companies? So the only real com competition is Chinese and the Chinese, um, they have Neo, which is garbage. And then they have Geely and BYD, which are two very good companies. Um, so that's pretty much it. And so you've got, you know, China now an open market with a factory that's working in China. <laughs> like that's awesome at the perfect time. And now they're like 50% of the EV market in China and they're taking a large market share of actually the entire Chinese auto market. And China wants people in these cars because it tracks everything you do. You know, it's, it's like a dream car for the Chinese government. Uh, not only does it video everything around you and in, really you inside the car, it tracks everywhere you go. So for China, between your phone and your car, you know, this is like ideal, you know. And so I think they sell millions of cars in China and millions of cars. And now you got Europe um, and the United States. So, so they go from, you know, 380 cars last year to maybe 500 this year, depending on when their factory comes up to a million cars in two to three years. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Ross, I know we were talking last night and, and I was, you know, mentioning, you know, sending the thing about the stock move after hours, and you were saying that, you know, maybe it's because, you know, Tesla could get to production uh, sooner. Um, one thing, I just got my first Model Y ride. My neighbor got one. And nice. it, yeah, it is, Ross, it is, mark my words, best Tesla today. I think, yeah, I know. I mean, I've been in one. Okay. 300000 yeah. to 600000 a year in sales of that car could be there. But um, the thing I love about you is you're not just this Tesla fanboy in the sense that you love the brand, but you're a prudent investor. I've seen you sell when it got really high in the 850, yeah. 900 range and trimming and you got ripped for it. I remember like yeah. when you were selling cause you're, you know, something at the house and then you bought some more and then you're not going to call it perfectly. Like you're, it, it's impossible to call these things perfectly. I got, I got ripped on. I sold some, I bought Tesla and I've owned it for a while, but I sold some at 651 about three months ago because I, it's like, I, I did too. Yeah. It's like, you, it, I don't know. I was so, I was so it, like Dennis Dick, who's on the show, who's one of my like mentors and in, in investing and he, and you, you're so much money in one stock. That's not necessarily a good thing. So no. I just told that and I bought some of these other companies, which I feel a little bit better at night, I guess, even though I'm a fanboy and I love it. And you, you, you know, I know that we have a chat room that people are going, you guys, when are you going to bring the other side, the bears? I'm like, we will bring the Tesla bears, but they're harder to get out there. They're embarrassed these days. Well, they've gotten murdered, these guys, and they were so right. outspoken. And I can be the bear. You know, it's not like I'm, you know, I try to be objective. Obviously, we all have biases. And investment biases are really damaging to people. 
You know, most people don't understand how to invest because they're actually like working with their emotions. And, and one of the things that people don't understand with emotion, like a lot of the people who are short Tesla simply hate Elon, you know? And so like the fact that they hate Elon drives them and it's like, wait, you know, like that's not an investment premise, you know? Um, so I might not like uh, Zuckerberg and I don't own Facebook, but I'm not going to like short it because I don't like him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for I've never done anything perfectly in the investment world, you know, honestly, I think that's another mistake people make is like, I'm going to call the bottom, I'm going to call the top, like, good luck with that game, you know. Um, but I manage a billion and, and, dollars, you know, and when you have a billion dollars, wait, my, my, no, I mean, you just have to be prudent, like people don't give you money, like, to take like huge risks, if you want to do that for yourself, yeah, I get that, but, but to take huge risk um you know for other people and fail is how you lose your career so i manage risk you know and and so if i make a killing if i make 20 million dollars i'm no idiot you know i i sell some of it yep yeah, absolutely and, and and ross we want to thank you obviously you ross is on the west coast he has his own um music studio in his house pretty sweet i was hoping to visit last time i was down there but um, you got up at 5.40 or you got to probably get up at 5 a.m. for us this morning. So we really appreciate that. Now you have your own, and this is the last thing, you have your you have your own money management firm. Like what's right. the name, like what kind of clients do you take on? Or if someone wants to reach out, I'll, I can send them over. But what what's like the, what's your money management? Yeah, firm? Gerber Kawasaki, you know, we're an independent investment firm, RIA. Um, you know, my pa my power is about to die on my my computer. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and um you know, we manage money for anybody. So we've used technology. So we have no minimums. You can find us at GerberKawasaki.com. We work with several broker dealers, Schwab and LPL. Um, so we work collaboratively with our clients, no matter where they are in life, to help them build their financial plans. And then we help manage their money. And we lower costs by basically buying investments directly. So we do use low cost ETFs and mutual funds. But in general, we own stocks and bonds. So we're old school investors. So um, so we're really active money managers as well. So we're building and managing money for individual clients. We have 7,000 clients and, and over a billion dollars in assets under management. And wow. we've used centralized computing to manage all the small accounts through technology. So that's how we're able to do it. Um, and then because younger people, most of our clients are younger, younger people are a lot easier to deal with client wise because of technology as well. So we're doing like a ton of Zoom meetings, you know, it's just like tons of Zoom meetings right now. And the kids like at my firm, that's like normal for them. And for our clients, it's normal, you know. Um, so we're really leveraged technology to help as many people as possible build a great financial future. And that's what my firm's about. Yep. No, and absolutely. that's what we do. Uh, and Ross, if you can, in like 10 seconds or less, prediction for the market by year end? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I have a crystal ball in my office just oh, to okay, say like, great. I, I'm the only guy with a crystal ball. <laughs> I think, I think if I could tell you, I understood what was going on. I can tell you the factors, but what I do think is the market will hit all time highs again this year. I think that the liquidity is crazy. I think this thing is going to get solved. Um, I, I think it'll be later in the year. And I think if Joe Biden takes the presidency in November, and this thing gets cured. 2021 looks amazing. So I'm not that worried about this year. I'm over this year. You know, like if if I break even this year, I'm happy and I'm I'm doing well this year um, relative yeah. to the market. I'm probably the best I've ever done. But but you know, if I can make money this year, I'll be happy. But I think it's all about 2021. So I'm positioning for that. Um, I'm long Vegas. I'm long you know. So I'm long MGM and I'm long Disney, which I think are my risk positions right now wow. uh, for 2021. Um, but I've been building a big position in MGM hotels in Vegas. So that's my pick for you guys. Wow. Um, right. Spencer, first time on, you're not supposed to ask hard questions like that. that oh, got, that was a, <laughs> no, that no was, I mean, I don't think it's a hard question. I just think, <laughs> you know, Get out the here. world is in such a disarray. I just can't tell you, you know, I think the market's going to rally today over, over, over Gilead's drug. Yeah. Um, and, and Gilead has solved so many viral issues. So I have a lot of faith in the Gilead people. We've been investors with them for decades and and it's been a crap stock so i don't even really own much of the stock but but boy they are smart there so you know i have a lot of faith in these people they're very smart i mean All right. yeah ross gerber is is the uh president and ceo of gerber kawasaki 
Uh, Ross, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. And hey, my uh, pleasure. And maybe you can get me on a, the 7 a.m. slot next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you. But we would love to have you on more. That, that was awesome. And I yeah, think yeah. I may, I, I think I may pick up some MGM because I, when you said it, I'm like that's such a bad pick. But maybe because I think it's so bad, I'm gonna right. buy it because the opposite, the, the inverse of me is probably good. What could, what else could go wrong? You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I love it. You guys are awesome. Thank sure. you. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ross. And uh, Jason, we'll let you go as well. So thank, uh, thank you guys. Have a great day. All right. 901. Uh, I want to bring on our next guest in just a minute. Before I do that, Dennis, Joel, do either of you have any final thoughts uh, before we go or thoughts on, on that interview or anything before I bring on our next guest? Uh, just final thoughts here on the market. You're getting a nice rally. We are leaking here a little bit. Again, it's what the market wanted. They want to see some type of therapy that works. And that's what we got overnight. And that's why the substantial called dash for trash or rallying of the stocks that have really been beat up. And you're seeing the sell off, obviously, in the COVID place. Just be careful. You start to see a turn. Keep an eye on Gilead as, you know, an indicator as well. If Gilead starts to, you know, really fade here, then, you know, maybe the market follows suit as well. Um, so Gilead could actually be one of your leaders today. So I'd keep that stock on my screen, even if, even if you're not trading. Uh, yeah, for the Gilead and the Boeing, like for the Gilead here, you're five bucks off that pre-market high. So I think if you're you know looking for a long exit or potential short, I think you're going to have to pick something up ahead of that pre-market high. Boeing is still hanging in there at 149. I think it got close to 150. So I gave you some other levels on that. Little selling pressure here in the S and P's. Uh, nothing major. Uh, we did slide a little bit. It's just a slow leak. I mean, people are taking some profits here. 2850. Your pre market low is a target. Uh, really, the top of yesterday's after hours range is way down at 3150. So. A tough day, tough day to call this. Have to rework the numbers uh, for next week. All right, Dennis, uh, we'll let you run. Uh, and I, I got to hop we'll... too, Spencer. I'll let Joel. you handle this one. Oh, man. All right, well, let me bring on our guest here uh, and uh, another first-time guest uh, on this show today. Uh, his name is uh, Iyad Izvahi. He is the founder and portfolio manager at Point at uh, Precious Point Capital Management. Uh, Iyad, good morning. Good morning. Uh, great to meet you guys at Quayton. Uh, so you are also up early with us this morning, so we appreciate that, Iada. I want to talk about uh, a short report that you published a couple of days ago, uh, maybe maybe even yesterday. I can't even keep my days straight at this point. Uh, it was MIDD. Uh, I, I read through the report, but give us your high-level overview on why you're short this guy. Yeah, sure. So uh, Middleby is, a, is one of the largest supply uh, manufacturers of commercial kitchen equipment, um, selling to uh, a quick and full service restaurants and hotels. But the company is essentially operated as a debt fueled roll up. It's made 90 acquisitions since 2001. And, uh, and we see evidence that it's used this m a to mass deteriorating organic growth and weak cash flow. And that was before the pandemic hit. Everything has changed since this pandemic has hit and Middleby is at the eye of the storm. Um, so our view differs from the consensus view. Wall Street consensus view is for record profitability and margins in fiscal 21, despite the fact that restaurants are permanently closing their doors at a record pace. Um, Overlevered uh, chain restaurants are cutting unit growth and CapEx and, uh, and large franchise, franchisee groups are, are on the verge of bankruptcy. We're seeing a lot of headlines around that as well. But what's being missed um, in the Wall Street consensus is that this trouble within the restaurant industry, which Middleby serves, um, will result in a flood of used equipment hitting the market uh, soon. And, um, and, and we think that that's going to wreak havoc on, on the demand and pricing for Middleby products. Uh, so as its net debt hovers near all-time highs and its profits are facing um, you know, unprecedented hurdles, we don't think that Middleby is going to acquire itself. It's going to be able to acquire itself out of its problems as it has in the past. Um, and that the shares are likely to fall another 50% and they're already down um, uh, 50%, but we think they, they, uh, they have an additional downside of 50%. So, you know, this is really uh, a presentation of a view totally, you know, uh, divergent from the Wall Street consensus, which we think is totally implausible. 
you talk a, a bit about the how there will not be a a, a so-called V uh, recovery here. Uh, now, is, is this more of a? I, you're obviously bearish the uh, the company because of their their debt, like you talked about. But is it is it more of a um, sector-wide bearish view that this company just happens to uh, have uh, be over levered, or or is it like would you been bearish six months ago? Um, well, look, we, we at, at my firm rather is, is made a specialty of, um, uh, of identifying companies using acquisition accounting, you know, these aggressive roll-ups that just acquire company after company, uh, but are using aggressive accounting to hide true fundamentals. Acquisition accounting allows a lot of flexibility for managers to flatter, uh, their financials and to hide again, you know, deteriorating fundamentals, often organic growth. And we see these things unwind during periods of trouble where they can no longer make acquisitions at the same pace that they have in the past. We already were looking at Middleby critically ahead of the pandemic. And uh, so we know the company very well. We've, we've followed it for many, many months. Um, but, uh, but now it's, uh, it's essentially found itself in a, a shitstorm. Can, it is, can you uh, explain? It is, is, is in, sure. Can you can you explain why there's going to be uh, a a flood of used equipment hit the market when I guess when we get past this eventually? Yeah, sure. So the restaurant industry is in a lot of trouble, as everybody knows. Um, you know, the rest the National Restaurant Association is estimating that uh, about 15 percent of restaurants nationwide by the end of this month will be closing permanently. Um, and, uh, and, it, you know, and, and so you couple that with all of these headlines about very large fran- franchisees um, being on the verge or uh, announcing bankruptcies. And you say to yourself, what does this mean? What this means is that their uh, kitchen equipment are likely to be liquidated and um, and as that happens, um, you have this flood of used equipment hitting the market, eating into the demand for middle B products um, and, and also uh, resulting in tremendous pricing pressure. So it, the, the, this flood of used equipment is a direct function of the trouble um, that the restaurant industry is facing. And, the, you know, as the consensus projects a V-shaped recovery for middle B, in essence, they're projecting a V-shaped recovery for the restaurant industry. It just doesn't make any sense. But Middleby is, in, you know, is going to be hit also with the second order effect. So even if, even in the off chance that uh, the restaurant industry recovers in a V-shaped pattern, Middleby will not because of the factors that we, that I just cited. Uh, an eagle-eyed uh, listener or viewer in our chat pointing out that there was a uh, several big insider buys uh, this week uh, and and I guess last week or the week of uh, April first as well. Uh, how much of that is a factor you think in, in just the stock's recent performance? Um, do I think that that's a factor in the stock's recent performance? I think I think it's uh, it's irrelevant. I think that Middleby is in a world of trouble. And um, and, uh, and and uh, and and that it's it's going to be the the most levered that it's been in recent history, as a function of its decline in EBITDA, it's going to have a very hard time working itself out of this this, this uh, state of leverage. So, what what would like what is the best case scenario here for uh, for middle B like a, as a company? Obviously, you're short, so you're betting on downside. But like what what could happen uh what could they do to eventually prevent that from happening if at all okay so so let me begin by saying you know we we've had conversations with middle b customers um and competitors we've spoken to um one of the largest distributors of commercial equipment who says that um sales for an industrial kitchen equipment are currently down like 85 percent. i mean this is this is a huge huge hit. Um, but what could go right in a perfect scenario? Um, well, I would say that uh, 
that the economy that 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 a vaccine is announced um, for the COVID for COVID nineteen, the economy and consumer behavior miraculously um, uh, demonstrates a V shaped recovery. These restaurants that have announced um, their intentions of shutting down don't shut down because consumers are now getting back out there. No one's scared anymore. And because of that, um, chain restaurants announce that they will uh, that, that they will no longer be cutting back on their capex and unit growth. Um, and then all of a sudden, you you have a reemergence of demand for Middleby products sooner rather than later. Uh, and Middleby is able to continue to aggressively acquire new companies in order to demonstrate growth and mask deteriorating organic growth. If all of those things happen, the stock price could shoot higher. It's just, you know, in our view, completely implausible that, that all of those things are going to take place. Um, and and Middleby uh, comes out unscathed. So you've got a uh, base case price target of thirty three ninety, a bear case of sixteen dollars and forty one cents. That comes out to about twenty six or twenty seven dollars uh, on on the the blended price target. Is that a twelve month out forecast? That's a, yeah. That's that's based on fiscal um twenty one numbers. Okay. So we're we're kind of like looking past fiscal twenty twenty, and we're yeah. we're now matching. Uh, our numbers against the consensus, but yeah. Okay. Um, and I want to, before I let you go, I'll, uh, also ask you about a stock you are long, uh, Memedex, MDXG. Uh, this one's, I, I mean, taking some heat with the rest of the market. Can you outline your your bullish view here? Yeah, Memedex is one of the most dislocated opportunities we've ever seen. Most One of the most undervalued stocks that, that we, we we know of. Um, it's, it's essentially a turnaround situation. Uh, the company is on its way out of a period of turmoil. You know, they announced a, a, um, a accounting restatement and the stock was delisted. But, but it's now emerging as the best company in its class in a high, highly desirable and a, a growing industry. Now, we engaged in an activist campaign um, to install world-class business leaders on my Medics' board during this turmoil. And that ultimately resulted in a successful deal with the company that placed it on a solid road uh, to recovery. If you look at the equity today, it's sold off, you know, two times more than the Russell 2K and three times more than the S&P. Uh, we believe on forced selling to meet margin calls, but, you know, we're, we're, we're licking our chops at this dislocation. And um, we already own close to 8% of the company and have been adding to that stake down here. Um, we think that the sell-off is completely misdirected and, uh, you know, the stock is worth at least double where it trades, but most likely three to four X where it trades today. And we think uh, that there are a number of catalysts over the near term, which are likely to stem the, the, uh, the shares higher over the such next three to four months, essentially. Such as? Yeah, such as uh, the filing of its fiscal year 2019 and Q1 2020 financials. These will be significant. Um, uh, landmarks for the company, the relisting of its shares on the NASDAQ, uh, likely a couple of months after the filing of its Q1 2020 financials, uh, a resumption of research coverage by sell side analysts. Um, you know, we, in general, we believe the company's leading market position in the fastest growing segment of advanced wound care will make it a popular uh, takeover target as well. Uh, as most recently evidenced by Smith & Nephew's purchase of Osiris, uh, a key competitor, last year. So, you know, we, we know that there are a, a number of large strategic strategic players who are, who are currently seeking to enter the growing advanced wound care space. My Medics is extremely well positioned as a market leader of that space. All right. Uh, Iyad Isbahi is the founder and portfolio manager at Precient Point Capital Management. Iyad, thanks so much for waking up early and spending some time with us and uh, be safe out there. Thank you.
All right. Uh, I want to wrap it up here at 9.15. That'll be it for our broadcast uh, this morning. Joel and I will be back with you at 3.40 for the final show, uh, market wrap-up show of the week. Thanks to our guests, Ian Bahi, Jason Rasnick, and Ross Gerber. You can always catch a replay of this show on YouTube or the podcast on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes only, not for investing or trading advice. Everyone have a great rest of your day and be safe out there.